Hello, everybody. Eric Grenier here, and welcome to the 77th episode of the RIT Podcast. It's election year in Manitoba. The polls haven't been very good for the governing progressive conservatives. The opposition New Democrats have been leading for years. Uh, so it is looking like an election that could be a change election. But will we be seeing any actual change in the polls between now and October? Joining me this week to discuss this Manitoba election year is Curtis Brown, principal at Probe Research, the polling firm in Winnipeg, and Ian Fraze, CBC's provincial affairs reporter in Manitoba. Thanks to both of you for doing this. How are you doing? Great. Very, Yourself? Very good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for uh, uh, an election in Manitoba, of course. Ian, uh, I'll start with you. It is still a little bit of time between the election. There's, uh, it's, it's scheduled for very early October. Um, but how would you assess both the PCs and the NEP, their preparedness for what is an election year? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, the PCs are, are trying to get ready. They're, you know, they're going to hope that a lot of their work over the last year finally gets rewarded. When Heather Stephenson got into power or became the premier in late 2021, she spoke about being uh, or leading a collaborative government that would be less divisive than Brian Palliser, who had a brass reputation and and was focused on austerity. You know, they've made a bunch of spending announcements. They've collaborated with the city on transit funding, on a water treatment plan. They've tapped into federal dollars as well, All, all in the hopes that, you know, it would sort of turn the tide that the party would be able to uh, climb out of its hole and and start making in in grounds and that hasn't really happened yet so the party's going to hope that that starts to happen um you know they're going to count on tax cuts where we're expecting you know some form of 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 a, of a tax competitiveness review to come out and we're going to see some, likely some tax fund tax cuts to be announced in the spring. So the the PCs are going to hope that this starts to make headway and that they are able to distance themselves from the past. As for the NDP, you know, they're they might be to some to some degree in cruise control uh, right now, hoping that they can continue to link Stephenson's unpopularity with the unpopularity of, of Pallister, and that they can continue to. Um, show that they are um, the government in winning. And there's been, a, Ian, a fair number of MLAs who've already announced that they won't be running again. So maybe they see some of the writing on the wall. Yeah, a- absolutely. We've seen 10 or, 10 or 11 Tory MLAs. Mind you, many of them are from rural ridings. The party is likely to win, but that hasn't necessarily dist- instilled a lot of confidence in, in, in the greater public that you know the, the PCs can, can find a way to turn their fortunes around. Well, uh, Curtis, you know, you've been watching the polls, obviously, that you've been conducting in Manitoba. The, the, it's the one really regular poll we get out of Manitoba the, that's done by Probe Research. And I think that the PCs haven't led since, if I'm not mistaken, the end of 2020. Uh, so is there a way to turn this around after PCs have been trailing for so long? Brian Pallister's numbers were quite bad. Heather Stevenson's own personal numbers haven't been any better. It seems like it's it's a tough tough hill to climb. Yeah, and yeah, Eric, you're exactly right. It was September 2020 was the last time that the Progressive Conservatives were leading in our poll. Uh, The trend line in our poll is about as flat as the Manitoba Prairie, and it just has been all along. Like, it just doesn't seem that, you know, all the changes that Ian talked about and all the different things that Heather Stephenson talked about when she was going to be coming into power, um, that just didn't move anything. And the biggest reason that didn't move anything is that there is a huge, huge, huge gap between uh, NDP support and, you know, between the two parties in Winnipeg. The NDP has had uh, a huge lead over the over the NDP, and that's, and that's where elections are won and lost in this province, uh, is suburban Winnipeg. And so, yeah, I mean, everything that they've tried to do in terms of yeah, trying to have a more open, collaborative government, and you know, trying to get along better with the city and the federal government, and some of the other initiatives that they're doing, that just hasn't moved the needle. And so, at this point, yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's going to be a budget in the spring, a pre-election budget. Um, that might be something where they might try to move the needle a little bit. Uh, there might be some other initiatives that we might see, but uh, but yeah, it seems that just all along, uh, nothing really seems to have kind of changed that. Uh, change that. I mean, but, you know, having said that, uh, you never know. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the damage that the Conservatives sustained was when Brian Pallister was the Premier, and it was during the depths of COVID. I mean, in September, Manitoba really didn't have a first wave of COVID. 
uh, unlike other places. And then the second and third waves were particularly rough here, and that was really when a lot of you know the problems with the healthcare system. There was a really unpopular um, uh, proposed changes to the education system. These sorts of things happened, and that really dragged down the conservative support. And it's never really, it's just never really recovered from that. Um, but you know. Yeah, six months, you know, once people start to really think about a provincial election, um, things could change. I mean, ask uh, Adrian Dix in BC or Tim Hudak in Ontario, uh, you know, how things turned out when sometimes you're on cruise control and you have a big lead. Um, it, it seems likely there will be an NDP government, but I don't think that we should, and we don't, I don't think we should be writing the Progressive Conservatives obituary quite yet. Ian, uh, Curtis mentioned a few reasons, but what do you think is behind the struggles that the PCs have had over the last few years? And does the party itself understand what's going wrong? Yeah, it's a, another good question, Eric. Um, do, they, do, they, do they understand? And I, I mean, maybe to go back, it's, it seems that for some reason that, that, that voters seem to have a, a long memory here in Manitoba, at least in the fact that they are looking back at the, at the pandemic. And, you know, we're no longer arguing about vaccine mandates or et cetera, but the, the failures there have really stuck. And I think that the PCs have lost the voters' trust. And to rebuild that is going to be a challenge here. The NDP has been really strong on, on the health care file. And they've been able to show that, you know, hey, maybe, you know, as Curtis mentioned, some of these unpopular, um, you know, health care consolidation, you know, we closed six ERs down to three ERs that maybe we're seeing the effects of that past that, that we're continuing to see struggles in healthcare, that during the pandemic, you know, we had to send uh, some intensive care patients out of province. We had to fly them away because we don't have enough room here within Manitoba. And the NDP has really been able to hammer on that piece. And, and, and the government has struggled really to try to uh, make, to try to get out of that Achilles heel, which is, which is healthcare for them. Is the are the PCs aware of it? You know, they, they definitely are. They've, you know, on the healthcare file, they've committed two hundred million dollars to try to recruit and re and and retain healthcare workers. That could help. Again, there's still there's still time for them to kind of turn things around, but uh, it's it's going to be a tough road for them. Uh, Ian, just uh, quickly, you know, uh, watching it from outside of Manitoba. You look at some of the other prairie provinces, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, the premiers there go to war with Justin Trudeau. Um, do, you, do we see the same kind of style with Heather Stephenson? And on health care itself, you know, would, there be a lot, would there be an interest or, or an enthusiasm on the part of the PC government to reach an agreement with the feds that you know, get some more funding into the province and not take the route of you know, an anti-Ottawa approach? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we... we Manitoba often gets lumped in with Alberta and Saskatchewan, but we are a fairly middle-of-the-road province, and, and you see that because there isn't as much of an appetite to, to go to war with Ottawa. Uh, getting a, a deal arranged, you know, Heather Stephenson is the chair of the Council of Federation. If they can get a deal arranged, if they can put more money into health care, you know, the equalization payments are up significantly. Manitoba's getting an extra $500 million. That, you know, if that can all come together and, and a bunch of that money could go into health care, that could, that could be something the PCs can show to voters in the fall and say, hey, uh, we, we, are, we are making some inroads. Uh, Curtis, uh, just a, a little bit of a historical perspective. The, you know, the NDP last came to power in 1999 under Gary Dewar, and that was a, a change election. And then the, the time after that, we saw a change was only in 2016 with Brian Pallister. Do you find any parallels between where Manitoba is now and where it was back in you know the Gary Dewar days when you came in? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. You're having to make me, you know, really think way, way back. Um, uh, may, maybe to, you know, maybe to some extent. I mean, the circumstances are a little bit different. I mean, in 1999, you know, Manitoba had, you know, and under when, when Gary Filman was the premier through the 90s. I mean, Manitoba had come through a recession in the early 90s, like everywhere else in Canada, and like a lot of other governments had to really cut, you know, a lot of spending, especially in healthcare and education. And it, by the but by the time of the late 90s, that was when they were really starting to kind of ramp up and say that, you know, now that the economy is doing a lot better. We're going to be able to, to spend more money and do this sort of thing. And, and, and the Conservatives at the time actually made a fairly aggressive um, pitch in terms of both tax cuts and spending. And at the time, it was almost 
seen as being too much. And the NDP had a very, with Gary Dewar, had a very incrementalist, um, you know, sort of approach, saying like what they're promising is too much. We're going to put money back in healthcare, and we're going to put money in education. They actually had like five promises, and it was modeled a lot on what uh, Tony Blair and, and New Labour did in the in the UK. Um, and that was in, in Manitoba. Just generally has a very, like Ian says, a very middle of the road or kind of an incrementalist political culture, and that worked as opposed to this bigger, you know, bigger kind of more aggressive promise at the time by the progressive conservatives. One of the other things that is interesting, I think, just about kind of what's been happening now, and when you think about the 90s, that's sort of, I guess, you know, I mean, everything from the 90s is popular again, apparently. Um, but, uh, but the conservatives have actually, one of the things that they've really tried to do now as kind of a wedge is really kind of take a lot of, uh, a lot of the, rhetoric, the tough on crime rhetoric and, and, you know, really talking a lot about um, uh, justice issues and, and public safety and that sort of thing. And that's something that they've really changed their tone on, and, you know, much more aggressively in the last few months. Um, really trying to sort of paint the NDP as being, you know, soft on crime, they'll defund the police, some of these sorts of things, and talking a lot about how, yeah, they're going to put more money, in, you know, into the police, and they're going to try to, um, you know, get tougher on, you know, get tougher on violent crime, and some of these sorts of things. And in many ways, they're kind of trying to sort of take this very old messaging that they were really talking that the conservatives in the '90s uh, were talking a lot about, and really kind of reviving uh, a lot of that. And that's also interesting because a lot of the people, Heather Stephenson, a lot of people around her, kind of that's where they really cut their political teeth. And so that's really, uh, you know, that, that's sort of interesting that that's a bit of a, you know, sort of a bit of a throwback that's kind of come in as a way to sort of be able to try to, you know, do something to attack the NDP or stall the NDP's momentum um, heading into the election. That's uh, an that's, uh, attack that the Conservatives have taken, you know, now in 2023. Let's uh, move uh, to the NDP. Ian, um, you know, you mentioned that the NDP could more or less just be on cruise control for the next few months. Are they in such a good position just because of how rough it's been for the PCs? Or as Wab Canu and the NDP, have they... Done and have they put themselves in this position where they're on track to win? I, I would say it's a bit of both. Uh, again, the the level of distaste that is out there, which we can see in the polls, especially in Winnipeg, kind of shows you know the the anger and the frustration with with Heather Stevenson. You know, in, a, in another poll, the, uh, you know she is seen as the least popular premier in the country. So the NDP has been able to capitalize that. But, but further than that, you know, Wab Canoe, the, the NDP leader, has had one election under his belt. And since then, you know, the party has been rather uh, disciplined. They've kept things on really core issues, you know, health care, as I've mentioned before. They beated the drum about privatization and, and, and play that boogeyman. Um, they've sort of kept things on, 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 on sort of a, a few matters that that you know Manitobans tend to care about you know again healthcare being a big one and that disciplined messaging um, has has helped you know I guess probably convince some Manitobans that they could be in power again. Ian what would be the path to a majority for the New Democrats in Manitoba? It would come down to some some Winnipeg suburbs uh, we, you know, we, we talked earlier about some PC MLAs leaving many of them are in rural seats they are so that means that in these Winnipeg suburbs where elections are won and lost, the NDP will have to face some, some Tory incumbents. You know, Audrey Gordon, the, the health minister, uh, the family's minister, Rochelle Squires. So the NDP will have to sort of win some of those seats. But again, with, with where, where polling has been, again, lot, lots can change, but you know, they'll have to flip a number of those seats to take out, to get a majority. Curtis, how, how do you think the uh, NDP is setting itself up, you know, in terms of its support to get a majority? Yeah, I think that Ian's exactly right. I mean, it, it comes down to suburban Winnipeg. It comes down, that's where elections won, are won and lost. And I think that that's, that's where the interesting thing, that dynamic of a lot of these conservative MLAs who have been retiring, most of them have been from rural areas. And some of the ones who are probably in more danger, like Audrey Gordon or Rochelle Squires or some of the other ones in suburban Winnipeg, uh, are actually running again. Um, those are the ones that are probably the most vulnerable. Those are the ones that the, the NDP would be, you know, sort of, I guess, most likely to pick up first. Um, there are a few sort of at more the outer suburban parts of Winnipeg or, you know, right around the periphery of the, the capital region that, uh, you know, would, would be ones that, um, you know, would kind of be next. Um, but then, all, you know, and then after that, I mean, so that probably would get the NDP to 29 seats, which is what you need for a majority or close to 29 seats. But they, to me, the interesting question or the interesting thing is how well would the NDP do in rural Manitoba? 
Um, because you know, typically when the NDP wins in Manitoba, when Gary Dewar and Greg Selinger were premier and were past NDP governments, they would usually have a decent amount of support in places like Dauphin, Swan River, Brandon East, Selkirk, uh, some of those seats. And I mean, our polling has shown, yeah, the NDP has a huge lead in Winnipeg and they win lots of seats in Winnipeg. Um, but the Conservatives still do have a pretty significant lead all the way along in, in rural Manitoba. They still have a lot of support in rural Manitoba. So a lot of those seats were Conservative MLAs are retiring. The Conservatives would be probably likely to keep them, um, and they and you know you could end up with a situation where you have an NDP government that is very urban Winnipeg heavy, um, with very little uh, support except for northern Manitoba uh, outside the perimeter highway. Does the NDP have a, a lot of room for maneuver? You know, when we are we've been talking a lot about the Alberta election and for the NDP there, you know, it, it could come down to a few seats. Their ceiling gets is is pretty low over that majority mark. Uh, Curtis, do you find that the NDP has a similar situation? Or do they have a little bit more room, a little bit more wiggle room in this campaign? I, I think they do have a little bit more wiggle room just based on the number of seats. There are more seats in Winnipeg that would get them close. Um, and then I think you, 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 know, you do have seats that are kind of relatively close to Winnipeg that are really, I mean, even though they're r rural, they're, they're not that rural. So this would be like Selkirk or Dawson Trail or uh, even Gimli, might, you might even include that. So it's a lot of people who kind of you know, live in sort of the exurban periphery of, of Winnipeg, um, where the NDP would probably have a good shot, you know, a pretty good shot of picking, picking up seats. So I mean, I think they do have a little bit more room. It's, it's some of the, you know, some of the other like more rural, rural seats that, you know, used to be more strongholds for them, like Dauphin, you know, Dauphin or Swan River, some of those might be a little bit trickier. But um, yeah, I, I, I do think that they, I, I do think that they have, you know, just based on, on where people live in Manitoba and the fact that Manitoba is so, so many people live in Winnipeg and the region around it, um, that that's where it would be as opposed to Alberta where, yeah, the, the NDP has to win seats in Calgary that are traditionally not very NDP friendly and that's really kind of where the election in Alberta is going to be won and lost. Ian, uh, I wanted to talk about the third party in Manitoba. Uh, you know, a lot of Western Canada, there isn't much of a third party, but the Liberals you know, do end up getting about 15% or so in the polls. They have a few seats. Um, in a couple of the by-elections, particularly in Fort White uh, recently, you know, they really gave the PCs a run. What kind of a role, Ian, do you think that the Liberals can play in the upcoming election? It's uh, an, an interesting one, perhaps. Uh, you know, the, the, the polling, though, you know, usually in, in non-election years shows the Liberals sort of flirting with the, the high teens, maybe even getting into the, the low, the low, you know, around 20, the 20 percent mark. They haven't really been able to do that since, you know, the 2019 election. Uh, it seems like voters aren't parking their support with them. So for that, that's definitely a, a concerning play for, for the Liberals. And now, yes, they have had success in the by-elections, but they've been able to pool all their resources, right? You know, in Fort White, they had a, a former Winnipeg Blue Bomber uh, going up against another Blue Bomber with the, with the PC. So uh, they, they've had sort of, a, you know, a bit of star candidates that have been able to make things competitive, but the overall picture is, is concerning. And, you know, it, again, uh, you know, going back to the polls, if, if, if they can, if they do follow through, it's questionable how how big of a role the the liberals can play. They have three seats now. You know they have uh, John Jordan, River Heights, uh, Cindy Lamaru, up in, in northern Winnipeg. Those two ridings uh, are likely to, to remain again. The NDP is making a play for Saint Boniface, where uh, Dougal Lamont there is is their leader. The NDP thinks that's one of them that they can flip uh, within Winnipeg. So uh, the the role of the liberals may may not be a big one. Curtis, what's your take on, on the Liberals, their chances of increasing their seat count uh, or, or, as uh, Ian just mentioned, losing a seat? And if it is a close enough election, if the Liberals can be the ones who cause a minority government, even with just two or three seats? Yeah, I, I don't know about that. I mean, how the Liberals do is really the fundamental issue in Man you know, Manitoba elections in terms of how the other two parties do. I mean, the NDP benefits when the NDP is, or sorry, when the Liberals are quite weak. I mean, when they're down around 12% or less, that's when the NDP are, are cleaning up and winning majority governments. If the Liberals start getting into that high teens, low, even to the low 20s, that's to the benefit of the Conservatives because then they're able to win uh, a lot of seats, in, especially in suburban Winnipeg. Um, that's where it seems to be. Um, yeah, I mean, Ian mentioned the by-elections. Uh, the Liberals did perform very well. I mean, we've seen that in the past that, yeah, in our polling, the Liberals always tend to do better between elections. Uh, they also, I mean, you have to 
you know, the other thing is the Manitoba Liberals are not a big party and they don't have a lot of resources. And so in some of those by-elections, they're able to throw everything they have at some of these seats that in a general election, um, they're not going to really be competitive in. And I, and I do think that, yeah, I mean, they're going to actually, you know, in terms of like where they're going to be putting their resources or their focus, um, they're going to be trying to save Dougal Lamont's seat and save Boniface at a certain point uh, because that's one that the NDP is really probably going to make a, a strong pitch for and has, uh, you know, the NDP historically has had a lot of support in that constituency. Even Cindy Lamaru in, in, in Burroughs, even though the Lamarus have always done very well and, you know, one of my rules in Manitoba politics is never bet against the Lamarus um, because they tend to win. But, I mean, that is, you know, f looking at kind of the fundamentals of what's happening, the, the NDP, um, you know, that's, that's a seat that the NDP should be able to pick up normally. Um, so yeah, I think the Liberals are going to be challenged to, to hang on uh, to their seats and they're, you know, to even sort of, I, I don't know where they necessarily would gain a fourth seat to, to get official status. I mean, they might say Fort White with Willard Reeves because he came so close, but I just, I don't see how they're going to be able to do as well in a general election where they're not able to put as many resources into, into some of those seats where, you know, in a by-election they did perform relatively well. Curtis, I, I will say. Uh, oh yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I j just will say on, on those by-elections. I, th I think, you know, the two in Winnipeg are also a, a cause for concern with the NDP. Uh, mm -hmm. They are so. They have so much, you know, popularity. It seems in Winnipeg, and yet they weren't able to flip those seats in Fort White. They came in third. Uh, they came in, in in second in in Kirkfield Park. Uh, yeah, you know, the Liberals were able to pool their resources, but you know, you have. An, an NDP party that is as popular as, as it seems to be, and yet they weren't able to capitalize. Yeah. Uh, Curtis, um, I wanted to just quickly on the Greens, um, you know, their leader has been in the in debates. Uh, they've got, they were relatively close in a riding last time. Uh, do they have any ch shot of, of having an impact on this election? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know where they are. I feel like the Greens are kind of in the witness protection program right now. They, I mean, I think they're, we're, we're waiting, correct me if I'm wrong, Ian, but I mean, we're still waiting on a new leader because I think James Bedham isn't going to run again and haven't heard anything about that, about when that's going to happen or, or who the new leader is going to be. Um, there's only one seat that they've kind of been competitive in in the last couple of couple of elections, really actually only 2016. I don't think they were that competitive last time, and that's Wolseley. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, I mean, if, if the Liberals were kind of, pick, you know, typically the Liberals pick up votes from disaffected NDP voters when people are mad at the NDP, but in that particular seat, some of that disaffected, ND, uh, disaffected vote was going to the Greens. And yeah, in the 2016 election, they had a half decent shot at it with a pretty, you know, pretty well-known candidate. Um, but you know, ever since then, I just, I don't, I don't think we're seeing anything else. We're not seeing any kind of evidence of support for the Greens in our polling, or we're really kind of not picking anything up. And so I don't really see a situation where, you know, you look at Ontario and how, yeah, like the Guelph, you know, Guelph is a seat that the Greens have been able to, you know, get their leader elected and, you know, be able to keep in a couple of elections now. I mean, Wolseley would be that seat in Manitoba, but we're just not seeing that really. Uh, and I just don't expect that to happen uh, in this particular election, uh, you know, barring anything significant happening. Okay. Yeah, the Greens are supposed to announce, I believe this, this week, who their candidates are mm. um, to take over the leadership. So we'll see. There, there you go. All right. Okay. I'd like to hear from uh, both of you on this. And Ian, uh, we'll start with you. I know we're far out and, you know, this election is only in October. Uh, but if you're looking at the two leaders here, Wap Canoe and Heather Stephenson, could either of them survive a defeat? Boy, uh, I mean, let, let's start with Heather Stephenson. Um, if she can't, you know, pull out a victory, it, you know, it means that the PCs have, have lost Winnipeg. You know, she's been an MLA since 2000, you know, taking over uh, in the tuxedo riding uh, from, from Gary Philman, who, who was a premier in Manitoba. I, I don't see her wanting to stay and, and I don't see the party uh, wanting to keep her, you know, if, if that comes to pass. There would be a chance of renewal because, again, with the 10 or so MLAs not returning, they are largely in rural ridings. That's a bunch of new faces rurally you know if, if the NDP wins they've changed a lot of faces you know within Winnipeg so there'll be a lot of new MLAs for the in, in the Tories so it would be a chance of renewal I, I, I don't see her sticking around or, or even wanting to in terms of the NDP you know a lot of folks think this is their election to win so 
if Wab Canoe cannot pull it out, um, I, I don't see, it would be a tremendous collapse and I don't see, again, the, the party wanting to necessarily um, keep that going. Yeah, Curtis, uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I largely agree with what Ian, Ian has said. I mean, I, I do think if, if Heather Stephenson were not the premier, if she was a cabinet minister and some other member of that caucus was the premier, I don't think she'd be running again this fall. I think she would be doing what a lot of her colleagues had done and, and you know, after 20-some years, calling it a day. Um, you know, but she's the premier and she's going to lead the party into the next election. I mean, if they, if they win, I mean, that'll be, you know, I mean, that'll probably be somewhat unexpected, but, uh, you know, good for her. Um, and good for them. But uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I would not expect that, she, you know, she would stick around to lead them in opposition the way that, you know, Rachel Notley has done in Alberta, for example. Um, for Wab Canoe, yeah, that's, that's a more interest to me, that's a more interesting question. Um, I don't, yeah, I mean, I think really in the last, you know, few years, I mean, I haven't gone through one election. I mean, Wab Canoe has really put his stamp on, on the provincial NDP and, and, um, you know, I think it's kind of really built as Brown. I think it would be a massive disappointment within the NDP if they were to lose this election. And I think there would be probably a lot of finger pointing and a lot of uh, Monday morning quarterbacking about what went wrong. And um, I mean, Gary Dewar got um, uh, three chances uh, before he ended up becoming premier in 1999. I mean, the first one kind of in some ways didn't count because he kind of took over in the middle of that election and, and the NDP was you know, about to crash into the mountain at that point. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't see how, he, how Wab Canoe would necessarily get three shots um, to, to, to be, you know, to be leader. I would think that there would certainly be calls within that party uh, for someone else, especially if they, if they blew it after having such a, a, a big lead in the polls for, for so long. It always increases the stakes when the leaderships uh, are, are on the line too. Uh, so we'll finish on this. And again, I'll hear from both of you. Uh, Ian, I'll start with you. You know, there is about eight months or so before this campaign starts. I mean, the, the legislature I, I, you know, will, will rise at the end of the spring, and then that'll more or less be the unofficial start of the campaign. But what are you going to be looking for over the next eight or so months uh, that you think is really going to be an important factor by the time we get to October? Yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, I mentioned right at the start that, that tax review, I, I'm going to be looking at what that does. You know, Curtis mentioned, you know, the, the tough on crime messaging. I would be interested to see how the PCs sort of evolve that and, and what measures they take. You know, does the, the populace care about being tough on crime like they did in the 1990s? Does the populace care as much about tax cuts when, you know, we saw in Winnipeg the, the, the municipal or the mayor that was voted for, Scott Gillingham, the mayoral candidate, he was willing to boost taxes more than anyone else and, and Winnipeg are still voted for him. Um, I, I think we'll also see, you know, we, we've seen maybe in some appearances from Heather Stephenson of, of late, her becoming a, a little more feistier in, in her comments, trying to say that, you know, we have a plan, you know, we have a plan for health care, you know, the NDP, we haven't heard some of those specifics. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, out, out of the PCs, we'll see them, um, you know, getting their, uh, getting ready, I guess, you know, and, and really... Uh, making their argument for why they should win. Curtis? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be watching for a lot of those same things that Ian mentions uh, about yeah, what the Conservatives can try to do, what they can try to put in the window to be able to shift some of that support and be able to get it back, and whether yeah, whether the kind of you know very sort of retro 90s messaging around taxes and, and crime and spending and, and you know as a wedge against the NDP really, really works, or whether, yeah, I, I mean, I think the public is in kind of a different headspace now than they were then, and, and I, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, we haven't seen success on that so far, um, but we'll see what happens. The, the other thing I'm really going to be watching for is, is yeah, what is, you know, how does this campaign look for the NDP, and, and what kind of scrutiny is on Wab Canoe, because I think, you know, one of the things I think we can kind of take away from this and look at is that, you know, I think in the last election, I mean, there was a lot of focus on Wab Canoe's past, and the Conservatives, you know, were pretty tough on that. Um, but I also don't think that, you know, a lot of people really thought that he, there, he had a really good chance of becoming the premier. And so I really sort of wonder, you know, whether it's, you know, scrutiny from Ian and his colleagues uh, and, or, you know, it's even from the public in general. I mean, the extent to which people are going to be looking at, like, what does an NDP government led by Premier Wab Canoe look like? What are they going to do? What are some of their main policy things? And also sort of, you know, some of the you know, scrutiny or the degree of scrutiny that's going to be on that and how the NDP kind of deals with that scrutiny while also trying to kind of, you know, in some ways 
be on cruise control and kind of you know run a very I'm sure will probably be a very sort of conservative and, and you know try not to make mistakes kind of a campaign. Um, sort of seeing how that squares up and how they do in those circumstances, I think, is going to be one of the things that I'm going to be really interested in, in, in watching and also seeing what Manitobans um, think as that process unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's going to be an interesting year, and I know it's going to be a busy year for both of you. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast to set us up, and uh, hopefully we'll chat again before the votes are cast. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks for having us.